feels like a diary. All right, boys and girls, welcome back to episode four of the Lot G Diary. Today is going to be a little bit of a different diary entry because, as you can see, I'm sitting down. I'm not outside doing my normal waffle and telling you what's going to happen today. No, we're doing a Q&A for you, for the people, to let you know what you want to know. All right, before you say anything about mugging me off with the mic, saying, oh, you should have it under your shirt, well, it's actually for your benefit, for your own earlobes, all right? Because when it's under the shirt, it's just scruffle, scruffle, scruffle. So yeah, don't mug me off about that. Anyway, let's get on with the video. All right, so the first question that I'm going to address is a couple of you wanted to find out how tall I am. Now, I'm not the tallest of boys. A lot of my mates remind me of that very regularly, but I'm actually five foot seven, program height, five foot eight. You know, studs give you a little bit extra. Um, so not quite average height, a little bit below, but we're getting there, you know. We're still growing at 22. And this question about my height actually leads into a different subject that a lot of you guys seem interested in. This comment from Ryan received quite a few likes from you guys, so you're clearly interested to see what my answer is. And the question is, how important is physicality in college sports, meaning speed, height, stamina, etc. Now, as I just told you, I'm not the tallest person and I'm not the biggest person either. However, obviously, I've been playing college sports for three years and I think I'll get by. Now, there seems to be a big, I'd say, misconception that American football or American soccer is all about players being absolutely jacked, absolutely rapid, really good stamina, all of this. To a part, it's true. I mean, coaches do look for that, but what professional coach isn't going to look for that? I think once you get to a certain standard, every player is going to be fit. Every player is going to have a turn of speed and every player is going to have muscular endurance. Not necessarily huge, but they're going to have a little bit of muscle and they're going to be agile and stuff like that. So I think in terms of American soccer, those who are really developed technically can get by without having those other physical aspects. This question comes in from William and he asks, how do you structure your training sessions? So the way I structure my training sessions, and I think you guys probably should, is you need to find your weaknesses. Obviously, nobody is a perfect football player, even Messi, even Ronaldo. They're working every single day. They're working at stuff that they're weaker at in order to improve it. So for me, it's about finding my weaknesses. For example, in the previous videos, I've been showing you my low driven pings. That is a big weakness, as you can probably see from the clips, but it's something that I need to improve at. I mean, I'm not embarrassed about it because I know that I need to get better at it. So I think when you're making your own plans, you need to take into account what your weaknesses are and you need to be honest with yourself about what your weaknesses are because like i said nobody's perfect nobody is a perfect player so find your weaknesses work around the time schedule and uh yeah keep grinding do it for the love of the game this one from ethan is what is the best stadium you've ever played in for this question i have two options the amex that's brighton hove albion stadium and the stadium of light that is uh sunderland stadium so if i was to talk about history Seeing me as the Stadium of Light's been around for a while, I'd probably say that one. But in terms of an actual stadium, I'd probably go the Amex. I mean, the pitch, woo! But yeah, those are my only two options, so uh, sorry to disappoint on that one. Max and Lucio ask, what is my major? I'm currently studying communications with a minor in business and entrepreneurship and also doing a certificate in graphic storytelling or graphic design, something like that. Something to do with the university they have to do something extra but yeah that is my major minor and my certificate all right so a big question coming from you guys in the uk or from europe is how does college soccer like the standard compare to that in the uk so normally when i answer this question i try and break down the college soccer in america sort of the standards there so i'm going to do that first d1 top d1 teams are the best right out of whatever division you're in then you get down to D1 average schools and they are similar to D2 top schools. Then you go down one more and the lower D1 schools are probably equal to the average D2 schools. Now, like I said, this is just sort of a rough basis that you guys can go off. Then translating it over to the English leagues, I would compare the top D1s to English academy setups. A lot of players who have just been released at 18 go into the academy setups. Now, I know what you're thinking. They've been released, so it can't be academy level, but you're getting players from all over the world. They're coming together. And not only that, but they have four years to get better. So by the time that four year is done, they are at that academy level of the UK. Going down into D2, there's a little bit of a drop. Like I said, it depends what D2 school you're at, but I'd say the level is more around probably fifth, sixth tier of English football. 
Like I said, it's really hard to say that and to judge everybody in every team and all the teams in the UK, but that would be my attempt at it. So this question asks, where do I stay and how do I pay for it? So a few of you guys wonder where you stay when you first come out to America. The first thing that your university does is put you in dorms, in halls. So you're in halls of residence for generally about the first year or two years of your university life. And then after that, you're allowed to move off campus into apartments, into a house with a couple of mates. It's all up to you really, as you're adults by then. You can do what you want. And in terms of paying for that, if you're on a scholarship that covers it, then the school pays for it. And as soon as you move off campus, they'll send you a stipend that allows and helps you guys to pay for that. If you're not on a scholarship, then it's up to you to pay that bit and uh, yeah. This question asks, what do I think about JUCOs? Now, coming into America, I really didn't know a lot. I wish I knew more about the divisions, about the different um, American soccer things like NCAA, NAIA, NGCAA. But I would say junior colleges shouldn't be frowned upon because if you're in a situation where you don't have the grades to go straight into an NCAA school, then JUCOs can be a great way to get in, get some experience and up your grades in order to get to a good D2 or D1 school. Currently I have a couple teammates who started their university journey at a JUCO and they are now at the same D2 as me so it's a different journey but we've ended up in the same place so I think they shouldn't be frowned upon as much as they may be. Emily asks a very good question. She asks have you ever experienced a burnout in football and do you have any advice for anybody who has? If any of you guys have been here for a while, you know that obviously I wasn't getting played at my D1 university. I was actually left off the roster completely, wasn't allowed to train with them, and that is why I transferred. Now at this point, it was very low. Um, mentally, I was in a bad place, and I thought that I might end up quitting football. However, when I came to the D2, I got that love of the game back. That's what I'm talking about, that lot G guys. That's why we're doing it every day. You've got to play football for the love of the game. I know a couple people now, right now, who are in situations where they're not enjoying their football. It doesn't matter what level of football you're at. You could be a pro footballer, you could be an academy footballer, you could be a college footballer, like myself. If you're not enjoying playing football, then you need to find that love of the game again. And then you'll be back on you'll be ready to grind and play for the boys. Come on. This question is, are colleges paying student athletes and are they allowing me to make any revenue off my YouTube videos? Now, some of you seem a bit confused about scholarships and getting paid by the universities. No university pays any athletes. If you think about it, you'd have to pay for the university bill otherwise. So they're saving you money by giving you a scholarship. And that is sort of like paying you to play. However, you're never going to see somebody getting paid in order to play for the university unless they have an overload on their stipend that does happen sometimes at the end of people's terms. I'd love to make money from YouTube. However, the NCAA doesn't currently allow that. That's annoying, but we're doing this to help you guys out. So I'm not too bothered. I enjoy making the videos. That's why I'm here. Edin or Eden asks, what camera is best to record your games i just say any camera that records hd all right so as long as it can record and you can upload a video in 1080p um, that is classed as hd then you'll be fine and i'm pretty sure iphones any any phone to be honest records in hd nowadays so as long as you can record on a hd device then you're sorted However, one thing that I would suggest is that maybe you purchase a tripod so the person that is filming you has a steady camera because the last thing the coach wants to watch is some unsteady footage of you on a Sunday league field or something like that. So always get a tripod and uh, yeah, just make sure it's HD. Eli asks, what is your overall goal for football and what are you gonna do after you finish university? Now, as a lot of you guys know, my overall goal is to become a professional, however, the last three years have not gone anywhere near to plan. We've had a lot of setbacks and currently my goal is just to play football again. I want to play football. I want to play some games. I want to get some minutes and we're going to see where it takes us. If I play well in the next two seasons, then who knows? But currently my goal is just to play, enjoy it and get the most out of it. As for what I'm going to do after university, that sort of is the same thing. I'm going to see what position I'm in at the end, whether this YouTube can do anything, whether me playing football can do anything and we'll take it from there. This question from Aiden is about the social life in America, whether you can go out party is a schedule two tense. Now, this is a question that a lot of people think about 
You might think, oh, I'm too professional to go out, but it's university. You're gonna have a good time. You're gonna have some drinks. You're gonna go out and party. The way that it normally goes is you obviously have two semesters. You have the full semester, which is when you've got your season, and you have the spring semester when you just have friendly games and basically training. So for most schools, they don't go out during the fall. There's not really any drinking during the fall unless it's within a big time period when there's space for you to, you know, recover. But if there's a quick turnaround, then there's not going to be any drinking. Then in the spring is normally the time when you'll go out because you're not playing that many games. You're not playing too regularly. There's a lot less training than in the fall. So usually if you're going to go out and socialize and party and maybe get a little tipsy, it's going to be in the spring. There is time, the schedule isn't too intense, apart from in the fall. This question comes in from Tobogo. He asks where somebody who's looking to play pro should go, whether it's D1, D2 or NAIA. And my answer for this is pretty straightforward. You wanna to go to the best school that you can, where you're gonna get playing time. Because you can go to a great school, but if you're not getting played, then there's no point. Because you're not gonna get any better, you're not gonna have that experience all that game time to show other coaches. So if you're trying to make it, go to the highest level that you can reach where you're gonna play consistently and keep improving your game. Dara asks, how much are the actual university fees? Now, there are a lot of questions about, is it really expensive to come to America? If you are interested in the fees of each university, it is easily available to see on Google. But once you see that, you gotta bear in mind that scholarships can pay for a lot of that fee. Elias asks, what type of socks do I prefer? Do I just use normal socks or do I use grip socks? For a long time, I've just used normal socks. Recently, for Christmas, I got a couple of pairs of grip socks. So I've been trying them out. They feel good, but I couldn't really tell you either way just yet. Alan asks, are the players who are the best players at 14 to 16 still the best players? And if not, what age did they fall off? Now, this is a bit of an interesting question because this means that you're focusing on the other players. Personally, I think you've just got to focus on yourself because we all know people develop at different ages. To be honest, try not to pay attention to those people who are better players now. Just focus on yourself and improve as much as you can. All right, boys and girls, that is gonna be it for the q and I hope this has answered some of the questions that you guys had. If you have any more questions, then go over to my Instagram and send me a DM. I reply to all the messages, but yeah. If you have enjoyed the video, then please hit that like button. It helps me out massively. Hit the subscribe button if you're new around here. And uh, yeah, remember, do it for the love of the game. I'll see you later. Peace.